Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Kevin Green. I'm a senior software engineer at Spantry, where I've been solving planning and optimization problems, among other things, for about four years. Uh, today, I'm going to go over the basics of what a planning problem is, how you might solve it, and how we can solve it in real time with Spring Technologies. So first, what is a planning problem? Uh, out of curiosity, when I say planning problem, how many people here know what I'm referring to? All right, not a lot of people. Uh, so if you are from like a traditional computer science program, you might have heard them described as constraint problems. Um, and if you're not, or if you're like me and then forgot it and later had to relearn it, it's whenever you have containers and you have things that you need to put into those containers. So the classic example is if you have a backpack and you have a list of items, how do you most efficiently fit those items into the backpack? But that's a pretty contrived example in my experience. And honestly, when I was learning about that, I never understood how planning problems could actually be applied to real life. Uh, so we're going to go over a few other planning problems. For example, a planning problem could be packing a car. Here we have someone putting people and items into a container for car. <clears throat> Much like the knapsack problem, we oversimplify everything here just to make it all work. It could be something like planning a college semester. This is a lot more complicated than the previous example, because here you have sections of courses. You have times, rooms, professors, certain commitments that you have to make about what courses are scheduled when. And more advanced planning solutions might even assign students as well. Or it could be something like this, planning a spring days conference. At some point, the organizers of the conference sat down and said, these are the talks that'll be occurring, and here's when they'll be occurring. And they tried to order them in a way that's best for us. The thing that all of these examples have in common is rules. Rules are how we know whether or not a solution is good or bad. In the Simpsons example, even though there's some clear disregard for safety throughout this entire process, the baby still goes in the car seat, the items still go in the trunk, and children still go in the back seat. If children went in the trunk and items went in the back seat, we'd say that was a bad solution. In the course scheduling example, there are a ton more rules, some of which are explicit, some of which are implicit. So there's probably a specific building that all music courses have to be in that's explicit and probably even has a name like the Center for Music. But there also might be a specific professor of music who, because they're pretty grumpy, won't ever work before 11 AM. And this might not even be written down anywhere. It might just be a preference. But if you're the person scheduling for the university, over the past five years, you've learned this, because every time you schedule this person before 11, they fight you. Scheduling in general has a lot of these fuzzy or implied rules. For spring days, I actually was able to reach out to the organizers and ask why the schedule was what it was. And the answer that I got was that it was more art than science. It was very implicit and understood. For example, they explicitly try to make introductory talks towards the beginning, which is why we start with an energizing broad topic and then dive into introduction to spring boot. Today, we started with some more advanced ETL batch streaming processes. And then there are a lot of unspoken rules. So for example, uh, certain people do better earlier in the morning. I like to think that there's an implied, most charismatic speaker, second day, 11 a.m. slot, but <laughs> I'm not sure. All of these problems are complicated, and they're all solved by people, not computers, or at least they often are. Many people think that scheduling problems are the type of problems that can't be adequately solved by computers because there's a lot of moving parts. It's very hard to grasp whether or not something is actually solved. And the reason is that when we think of a, a solution, we think of an answer to a problem. And in planning problems, solving the problem isn't enough. It's not that hard to get to an answer, but answers can be both valid and good. So spring days would be a totally valid conference if the days were switched. I think that it would have been great to hear about an introduction to the spring boot on the second day. But at the same time, the organizers have a belief that by putting that talk on the first day, they're making all of your lives better. 
And I would agree with them. I think that so far it's been a pretty great conference. But any programmatic solution that you write needs to take into account all of these different rules. Because as we start changing these solutions, as we start changing these schedules, we end up in situations where it's sometimes hard to describe why a fit doesn't happen, why a solution isn't a good fit. And when we're really talking about how good a solution is, uh, we're actually inverting it. I like to say that certain solutions are good because it's very positive, but in reality, every single thing causes us pain in the scheduling world. And when we're talking about these problems, we're really trying to talk about how much pain are they causing us. So here, we have a classic pain chart. If you're the person all the way on the left, green smiley face and no pain, everything's great. If we're in mild to moderate pain, it's, we've probably made some compromises, but it's probably still a fine solution. As soon as we start getting to severe or very severe pain, we get towards the valid solution, but not a good one. If you need to look like the person above seven to nine, you can probably do it if it's absolutely necessary, but it's not gonna be great. And we'd rather have every single attendee in the audience feel like the person above one to three than have five people feel like the person above seven to nine. And if we look at the face all the way on the right, we don't have a solution. Uh, I, I would say that as a general rule, if whatever proposed solution you put forth to pretty much any problem makes someone cry in pain, probably time to go back to the drawing board. So for a more concrete example, let's talk about grocery shopping. Suppose we're hosting some event, like a brunch or lunch or what have you, and we need milk and bread. We get to the store, we purchase the items without problem, and it's time to bring them home. If we drove and are packing them into a trunk, how do we best configure these items in relation to the car? Now, when I heard this problem at first, my gun instinct is, doesn't matter. I've, I've thrown groceries into a car plenty of times, and everything's been fine. But there are a lot of configurations of a car and groceries that just don't work. If we get to here and we close our car and drive home, we have violated a very important constraint, which is that all items have to go into the car. If any item doesn't get into the car, it's not a good solution. But that's kind of trivial. Um, I think that most people here would assume that that was implied. So let's actually put all of the items in. Well, if we put all of the items in, we might not have a hard constraint. This might not be completely invalid of a solution, but we're gonna end up with crushed bread. I don't particularly like crushed bread. I'll eat it if it's the only bread around, because I like bread. Um, so this isn't a great solution, but it is a solution. It's worth noting that the severity of how bad this is is also incredibly contextual. So if I'm buying this to serve to a fancy brunch. There are a lot of people that I don't know very well and I wanna make a great impression. This might be as bad as forgetting it. It might be a hard constraint. But if I'm planning on cutting it up and making some bread pudding or something, it might not matter at all or be a soft constraint. Soft constraints are the last type and often they don't even look like constraints. So if you look at this picture, my instinct was that everything's fine. But there is actually something kind of wrong with it, depending on how picky you are. If you were really trying to be efficient, then right now you have slight amounts of heat loss, or rather cold loss. So your bread is gonna be colder than you want, and your milk is gonna be warmer than you want. Really, really minor, and it's exactly the sort of thing that people often don't think about when they're dealing with these problems. But if we have a computer telling us where to put everything, it's not that hard to make it so that there are no constraints violated. So we can optimize not only the integrity of our food, but add all sorts of other rules. Maybe you only put bread or eggs in the back seat for whatever reason, you can throw that in too, and those can all be constraints. It's also worth noting that if we were to go to the store and purchase nothing, then this would be great. As I said before, when we're talking about planning problems, we talk about how much pain whatever the proposed solution puts us in. So if we go to the store and decide not to buy any items, then we're good. This is a perfect thing. Everything's in the car safely because everything is nothing. So 
I assume that most people here have gone grocery shopping at one time. This is all a problem that we've been able to solve without help from a computer. But as problems get more and more complex, sometimes we do need help. So the tool that I use to help solve these problems is called OptiPlanner. OptiPlanner is an open source Java-based library that's essentially just a constraint solver. At a minimum, you give it the facts of the problem, the rules of evaluating whether a solution is good or bad, and let it go. There are a lot of different customizations, like exactly what moves should make or exactly how you should start creating a solution. But to dig into this, we need a problem that's a little bit more complex than buying four items at the store and packing a car. So one problem that's always interested to me is team and project management. Or if you have employees, projects, and tasks, and they all have skills, who works on what and when? This is Team Week. I don't know if other people have used this before, but this is a tool that I have very much so a love-hate relationship with. Because uh, it shows things at a pretty high level, and sometimes I feel like it's at too high of a level. But as soon as you start trying to get more specific with Team Week, uh, it starts to become an administrative pain. You start to have to do too much work, in my opinion. So we're going to take on the mindset of an ogre eager company that's looking to squeeze every last bit of work out of our employees. After all, increasing the amount that people are monitored, reported on, and generally held accountable we should sure increase productivity. So if we dictate exactly what every single employee needs to do at any given moment of the day, we'll have a great company. So this example company uh, I call Totalitaria for obvious reasons, and we're gonna start building out the domain. Uh, for now, let's assume that like any software company, we're always right when we estimate things. So we know exactly how much each task is. One of the very first questions of a planning problem is, What's the variable in the situation? So we need to give OptiPlanner something to change, and we call this a planning variable. Here, we have three different configurations. We have tasks that can have a time slot and a person. So if you have, you know, building a DevOps as a thing, you might be changing who does that and when. Otherwise, you could have a person time slot, something like Kevin at 10 a.m. And whatever I'm doing at that particular time could be the thing that we change. Or it could be a chain of linear events where we simply say that I have 10 tasks because we know the order of them. I'll just work on them sequentially. Each of these is a valid option, and there are reasons to model things one way or another. Um, a big thing that I've learned throughout working with OptiPlanner and throughout preparing this talk is that there are a bunch of solutions to any given problem when you have enough complexity. In our example of totalitaria, we want to break up the day into small chunks. We want to be able to say at any given point, stop what you're working on, you have to take a break, or stop what you're working on, this is more important. In this model, the best solution is a person time slot. So that'll be the thing that we change, and it will look a little bit like this. So here we have assignments. Assignments have a time slot and an employee, so something like Kevin at 10. It has a optional task, so Kevin at 10 is either working on this or Kevin at 10 is on a break. Tasks and employees both have skills, and we have a bunch of these assignments, and we call all of the assignments, collectively, a schedule. Uh, it's also worth noting that in blue, tasks and employees point to skill in a uh, blue arrow. Um, there's essentially a join object. A lot of uh, design for OptiPlanner schemas is pretty similar to relational databases. So anytime you would need a join table in a relational database, it's good to have a join object in OptiPlanner. So this is a pretty simple model, but it's enough to actually get us start writing some rules, writing what's good and what's bad. You can use OptiPlanner with just Java, or Kotlin and Groovy also have great support, but I find that it really shines with drools. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with drools, it's a way to easily write understandable rules in Java. And it looks like this. So as I said before, a lot of principles in OptiPlanner and drools are really tied to SQL. And I like to think of this as SQL, because uh, at its core, it's all logic programming. 
So anything um, that you see under when is like a select or where, and any statements under then are like update and insert. So here we have an assignment. So whenever we have an assignment, and that assignment has an employee and a task, and we have a required task skill, or a requirement for that task to be completed, but whatever employee we had selected doesn't have that task, or doesn't have that skill, pardon, then we add a negative constraint. And this negative constraint is a medium constraint. So previously it would be analogous to the crushed bread. And one of the really fun things about these sorts of problems is every single decision you make has a business meaning. So if something is a medium constraint, that means that we don't wanna violate it often, but it's not the biggest deal. So here we're saying we're totally fine assigning employees to jobs that they don't have the skills for if it is necessary. If it's easier than not assigning that employee to anything or than letting that task go unattended. And I think that's kind of good because as a company, it's nice to encourage employees to grow skills, develop, etc. cetera. Um, if it were a hard constraint, no one would ever work on anything new. And if it were a soft constraint, every single one of your employees would potentially be working on things that they weren't adequately prepared to deal with. And that's also bad. Uh, so often in scheduling problems, you can't look at a single thing in isolation. It's nice here because we can say, for a given assignment, do this. Often, we need aggregations. So we're making things a little bit more complex here. Uh, we have a task, which has a certain number of grains. Grains is our perfect estimate from before. And we go through and we count up every single assignment that has this task, and we call that the grain count, or the number. And if we have assigned too many people, or rather too many time slots to this task, that's bad. That's a hard constraint. Um, with totalitaria, everything is perfectly estimated and very strictly budgeted. So if this ever is the case, we're losing money. And that's the worst thing in totalitaria. So uh, here we also see our first glimpse of using the variables to weight the score. If you see under the then statement, which is the update insert, we calculate a weight based on the grains and the grain count. So right now, we're saying that the weight of this violation is the number of grains that it needs to be minus the number of grains that it actually is. And we're calling that a hard constraint. The reason we do this is that, as we'll get to in a little bit, the actual algorithms that OptiPlanner uses are iterative. So if we didn't include this special weight, if we just made it negative one like the previous example, any time a task was over allocated, it would be constant. So if you had one task that was allocated, uh, or that other that was estimated for 10 hours, and it was allocated for 1,000, that would be the same as that one task being allocated for 11. This way we can actually improve. And you can use that weight to score and guide off the planner in some more interesting ways. So for example, I like employees to have roughly equal amounts of work. The easiest way to make things equal in the OptiPlanner is to use a square. So for each employee, we assign a negative soft score based on how many assignments they have been assigned. This way, if there's two employees and one has 10 assignments and one has six, that'll be worse than if there are two employees and they both have eight. Now that OptiPlanner has these rules, and I should also clarify, there are a bunch more rules that I'm not gonna go into, but I don't necessarily think it's most interesting to go line by line through a bunch of select style statements. How does it actually solve things? Generally, there are three phases, uh, and they're the same phases that people actually tend to go through when they build schedules or when they solve these problems. Everyone starts with nothing. So every single scheduling situation I've ever been in, someone will pull up a blank calendar and say, all right, let's put stuff on this. OptiPlanner is similar. You give it a clean canvas to work with, and at this point, you also know everything else about the schedule. So you know who your employees are. You know what your tasks are. You know the skills that these employees have and the skills that the tasks require. Any schedule is better than no schedule, so the very first thing that people and OptiPlanner do is they throw stuff on. And they don't do this in a particularly intelligent way. Um, they often make simple mistakes where it'd be a slightly more complex move to make things more efficient. But this gets everything into the system. 
So if we can't find a great solution after this quick construction heuristic, no big deal. Just like people, OptoPlanner will essentially tweak the planning variables over and over. So once we get here, we can start to move one by one. And eventually over time, after what's called the local search phase, we'll get here. There are a lot of changes to this algorithm that you can deal with. Um, for example, you, by default, the solver uses pretty simple moves. And they're actually really the only two moves that I've ever seen a person do. So if you have a big schedule in front of you covered in post-it notes, you will either take two post-it notes and switch them, or you'll take a post-it note and put it somewhere else. And that's it. But eventually you can get into really interesting things along the lines of if you change who is working on project A, that also means you need to change who's working on project B because those two projects are related in some way. So move generation, selection, and filtering are all really important and interesting. I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in them after this, but they aren't really the focus of the talk. For now, it's enough to know that with out-of-the-box configuration, we can get to a workable schedule like this. So now that we have a schedule, we're done. Company saved. We make money, and as is my experience, there's never really any change in software development. Tests were perfectly estimated, uh, no new sales come in, and projects are done when we say they're done. But obviously that's not really realistic. Um, so it's something that this company might need to address. And if you don't have a plan for interruptions, really bad things can happen. Uh, in my experience in software development, sometimes that can mean that uh, people end up working on too many projects at once. It can end up meaning that people are not necessarily prepared to deal with what they need to deal with. Um, or it can mean that you have someone not working on anything when it wouldn't be too hard to get them to actually be productive. And that's just software development. All in all, I would say that my career path is, is relatively low as far as the huge risks of messing up planning go. In other domains, it can be a way bigger deal. Uh, and for example, when planes get delayed, it can ruin holidays, reunions, or even just someone's day. Uh, I've been stuck in an airport for 12 hours and it's terrible. That's not even close to the worst thing that people can experience while traveling. So if you're unfamiliar with this, this is from the incident that happened last month at the United Airlines flight. In order to avoid delays for another airline, they assigned their crew to a flight which caused this person to get removed. Now, regardless of your political thoughts on this situation, I think that United can objectively say it was bad due to the PR nightmare that it caused. And this is a really interesting synthesis of people having intelligence from computers and relying on that without any input back. So what happened was a crew was told they needed to get onto a plane. And as soon as that crew was told from this automated scheduling system, that was the only course of action. And there wasn't any discussion. And it was simply just, how do we best implement the one solution we've been given? And bad things happened. Software firms rarely have the same sorts of potential individual negative impact. Uh, but some thought still needs to be put into scheduling. So we need a solution that's flexible enough to deal with conflicts as they arise in a way that hopefully doesn't result in an employee being forcibly removed from their seat. One of the easiest ways to put thought into scheduling while allowing for flexibility is a way simpler solution than everything I'm gonna talk about. And it's simply using an issue tracker with a pipeline. Tasks come in, they're prioritized, and employees work on the highest priority task they can. Uh, it's pretty simple, and it's uh, a relatively simple model to the task chain model that we mentioned earlier. But we want to know everything. So in totalitarian, everything is dictated from above, and every future point is known. So you know exactly what someone's going to do. So now, how can we continuously plan solely from a computer? The answer is to basically constantly plan the future, but be contextually aware of the past. So I, I apologize for the color overlap. I would strongly encourage people not to develop slides while they're using Flux. Uh, really messes up a lot of things. But um, if we're assuming that this talk is currently going on time and we're planning something right now, 
then we'd freeze right around 1115. Everything in the highlighted area in the red is in the past. We can't change that, it's already happened. Everything in the yellow, which is that middle part right after now, it would be really bad to change. So even though we want Totalitaria to be a relatively oppressive company, it's still probably not the best idea to, at 1159 when someone's heading out for lunch, say, oh, by the way, you're also working for the next three hours because it's slightly more efficient. So we make it bad to move anything in the yellow area, but it can still be done if necessary. And then everything in the green area is fair game. We treat it like a normal scheduling problem. With OptiPlanner, we can add and modify in new facts as they become known, inputting new sales, new estimates, getting feedback from employees on what they worked on. But we're at the point where we need to manage a system, or where we need a system to manage our data flow. And we have data flowing, and we like the cloud, and it's spring days, so spring cloud data flow. Scheduling in real time is a weird mix of batch and streaming. So we want to take facts in as they happen, and we want to output them, and we want to output schedules as we get new schedules, but in order for the scheduling algorithms to work effectively, you often need to reset the solver, or at least if you continue on with the same instance, you're likely gonna end up in a situation where you're using suboptimal solutions. So, I set to building out an architecture for totalitarian. And we're all familiar with architectures, they're boxes with lines. And it's pretty easy to start adding boxes with lines in Spring Dataflow. It's actually a really fun thing. You just drag a box, drag a line, and then you actually have infrastructure, just like that. Uh, so with Spring Cloud Stream, we can have three different pipelines. Uh, events from the outside of the system pipe into a database, automated scheduling job triggering the OptiPlanner task, a source from the OptiPlanner task pipe into a WebSocket, and we can have a batch job with these three things, and all together, we can have this. And if you're at the point where you're thinking this is a lot of stuff, you're, you're right. So this is a solution, and this was a solution that I was working on uh, relatively intensely for kind of a while. Um, and it wasn't until yesterday when I sat down with Mike Manella and had a pretty frank discussion on what was needed for this project that we realized this right here was probably not the best idea. Uh, and it's not just because it's overly complicated. It definitely is. There are way simpler ways to do exactly what I wanted with Spring Dataflow. But it's unnecessarily featured. The entire goal of this exercise and what I set out to do when starting this talk was to build something in real time. But at its core, what, what does real time mean? So in general, when people talk about real time, sometimes they mean sub-second, uh, but sometimes they mean sub-millisecond, and sometimes they mean tiny nanoseconds. But that's not really what real time is to people when people are scheduling things. So real time is all about perception. And one way I've started thinking about it is something is real time if you can have data as soon as it would be used by you, or as soon as you can maximize the effect of the data, you have it. And there are really interesting ways to get the data rather fast with Spring Cloud data flow. And I definitely like to explore those options in the future. Notably, there's an aggregator processor that can accomplish essentially what that seven node diagram did, but significantly simpler. Instead of implementing that or implementing the seven boxes with arrows though, you can get a solution for all of your problems if you just have the OptiPlanner service and 10 lines of code. Uh, this is actually how simple it was to, to integrate. So I'm very serious when I say I re-architected everything last night and it worked out really well. Um, so we, here we stream the best schedule we can make every two and a half seconds. Um, and we're basically just converting it to a JSON image, piping it to the WebSocket, and we can read in from that WebSocket with a React app. If you really want boxes with arrows, you can still have them. But this is, in my opinion, a lot more readable than the complicated seven node architecture. The timelines on the previous slide, plus a single command to Spring Cloud Dataflow, get us those top two boxes. Another 10 lines get us the bottom two boxes. And with a little bit of glue, we can get very boring live updates. So originally I was planning on a live interesting demo, but more and more, this just is a solution that kind of works. So here we can see 
I'm scrolling over to the left, nothing's really changed. One thing changed, and then nothing. And this was my experience when I had the solution up and running. It was really boring to watch because nothing happened for like five, 10 minutes. Because generally when you're scheduling things, nothing will happen for five or 10 minutes. So now we have a complete solution where we can dictate exactly what people should be doing in real enough time. Throw this on a big dashboard overlooking everyone's desks, maybe even angled to get that oppressive feel, and totalitaria is in business. As for what's next, I think the pretty obvious solution is to add this. So here, we have computer monitoring, bathroom door alarms, and constant reevaluation of our estimates. <laughs> and with Spring Cloud Dataflow, it's not too hard to get push notifications to your employees' phones so they know exactly what they should have been doing. <laughs> and I've been making a lot of fun of totalitaria in this entire discussion. But one of the things that I find really interesting about planning problems is that almost always they come from a good place. So I didn't actually start off making a solution that was crazy oppressive, or I didn't mean to. I started off trying to make a solution that I would really like and enjoy. But as with most problems, and especially planning problems, there's a lot of important work that needs to be done making sure that you aren't making a solution that technically is good, but isn't actually good. For example, you probably don't want to dictate exactly what someone's going to do for every 30 minutes. You probably don't want to dictate, or at least you probably don't want to monitor, exactly when their computer turns on and off. Just like you probably didn't want to say, we have to get this person off the plane at whatever cost. Because there are real negative impacts for both the companies that make those decisions and for the people that are subject to them. So I love these tools for their power and speed of development and their ability to actually help people get things done. But it's pretty important to focus on that last part, actually helping get things done. So when you have the power of humans and computers, make sure the best of both worlds. Be RoboCop. Write systems that are comprehensive and simple, that focus on taking advantage of the fact that computers can do hundreds of thousands of calculations and the time that a person can get up and get a drink of water, but also take advantage of the fact that humans know not to do certain things. Humans know what's bad and what's good at a very intuitive level. And a lot of planning problems and a lot of scheduling problems are basically figuring out how to suss out the intuitive nature of a human and get that into a computer. And constantly check your assumptions. Um, I've been harping on the United example a lot, and this is really just one of the first times when someone didn't get off the plane when they offered them money. And that was the source of the entire conflict. And they just assumed that at some point, everyone would take the money. So always make sure that you're aware of how badly things can go. Um, anytime you tell people what to do with their life or what to do with their body, you kind of want to be careful. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, thanks very much for having me, um, and if we have time for questions, I'd love to answer them. Otherwise, feel free to grab me after uh, this. We do have time for questions, but cool. first, round of applause. Nice talk. Thank you. How do you do optimization of the solution? So in your example, scheduling, there's more than one answer. So how can yeah. you rank them or like do some sort of reinforcement learning on you know, how, well you're, how well it's working? Um, so there are a couple of ways. Uh, there are definitely options along the like, reinforcement learning. But in my experience, you aren't making a schedule for something that's never had just a person make the schedule. So that person tends to be whoever reinforces. So you have schedules getting made, and you're working with uh, typically a non-technical person saying, that's a bad schedule, that's a good schedule. And as soon as, some, as someone says, that's a bad schedule, or that's a good schedule, underneath that is, that's a bad schedule because. And it's important to figure out whatever the because is. Um, if you mean more, uh, rather, there is also the ability to do uh, benchmark configurations. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different options you can tweak. And it's not too hard to say, all right, with these 10 arrays of different configurations, run all of the different cross-product configurations. 
Um, and you can start to get to an optimum solution there, but I think the answer to your question is more the first one. You just ask why it's bad. Cool, we got a, one more question back here. Yeah. Hey Kevin, good talk. Um, do you have any advice on, on testing systems like this? Because they can get pretty complicated. How do you, yeah, as they uh, get more complicated, how do you get tests that capture it? So for a very long time, it was a pain. I didn't like it at all. Um, I only liked testing out the planner solutions as of six months ago. Um, when they added a, I think I can get, there we go. Um, so this is what my, my project actually looks like. Um, I can make it a little bit bigger. Uh, this is all in Kotlin, and somewhere over here, we have a rules test. Um, so here we're using uh, what's just called the score verifier, where we say, um, where we build a schedule. So a schedule has projects, tasks, employees, days, time grains, et cetera. We get to the point where we have that, and we can assert that a specific rule has a certain negative weight. Um, so in this schedule that I very much so hand built and know for a fact that the project tasks should be fully allocated, but there's only one that's not, we can assert that hard score. And essentially as you get more and more complicated, you would just build this up. This is a pretty trivial example, but a common thing to do would be to build a known schedule, maybe for a past event even, and assert certain rules about it. Make sure that there are these constraints that are violated, and we know that we didn't capture them. Time for one more question. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about the local search phase and, and how it relates to some of the constraint violations and the overall scoring? Sure. Um, so uh, the construction heuristic phase, you, or sorry, I should repeat the question. The question was, how does the local search phase affect scoring? How does that entire process happen, basically? Um, the construction heuristic phase is very simple. You're just pulling from a list throwing it on. The local search phase, uh, you're doing lots of different tweaks, and essentially um, after each series of tweaks, uh, you look for a, a better solution. So if you perform some moves, and those moves produced a better solution, that becomes the new current best solution. As the constraint algorithms run and continue to solve, they'll keep going down uh, those paths, essentially. Um, anything that doesn't reduce the score too much until they find better and better solutions. Uh, eventually you can get to the point where you say, you know, stop if it, you haven't improved at all. You can add things like simulated annealing or things like uh, taboo entity um, selectors. Yeah, taboo entity selectors, which basically say ignore these things that we touched recently. Um, but in general, it is comparing it to the score and trying to make the score continue to go up. Awesome, round of applause. Thanks. Thanks.